This is one of the most impressive stories I have seen to be told, be it in animation or in live action. Hmm. Charlotte's story is astounding. Yeah. Astounding. And what really amazes me is how you incorporated her art into this film without losing it, the integrity and the importance of it and the personalization of it. Because as you well know, in animation, somebody could take her art and totally emasculate it into something unrecognizable. And uh, you haven't done that. There's great reverence in how you treat um, her paintings and in how you represent them here. And I think that is one of the greatest standouts in this film. Wow, that's really great to hear. Because that was real, a real uh, objective for us, um, was to be able to represent Charlotte and her story um, and uh, give her um, sort of the, the place that she deserves in terms of her legacy, but also um, really presenting her artwork um, to the audience. Because a lot of people... Um, they don't know about Charlotte. Right. And they, they don't know about her work, um, her life. So we had to figure out a way to um, create the world that Charlotte lived in, um, but it had to be distinct enough from her own um, art style. Mm -hmm. um, so it was really, uh, it was a lot of um, R&D, actually, just to figure <laughs> out how do, we, how do we do this in a way that... Um, would would make sense for the storytelling of, of, and and I think um, using those transition devices and using her her paintings kind of seeing them come alive on screen um, that was the way that we figured it would make the most sense um, and also put her artwork really front and center um, mm -hmm. which is what we always wanted to do all along well you mentioned one of the most outstanding elements in this film visually are the transition sequences done in the montage where you start with wet paper, drop watercolor on, and it bleeds, and then we start seeing that the next series of, of life paintings take place. And that is seamless. It is a seamless method of transition in this film. You don't waste any exposition, and it just brings us closer to Charlotte and her work. And hopefully her inner life. Yeah. We spent a lot of time thinking about what she would be painting mm -hmm. in those transitions in terms of her character development. And the, the contrast between the vivacity of her paintings and the darkness of her life in uh, Germany, for instance, is intentional. Mm -hmm. And the, the sort of realism and simplicity of the animation uh, as a, a juxtaposed with her work, is also intentional. Well, and that's something that's very interesting here, because in, in Germany, that was a very dark time. Even in Italy, it was a dark time. All of Europe. Um, but you don't have any darkness, per se, in, your, in the animation, in the telling of her story. And I found that really surprising, a welcome surprise, <clears throat> Um, yes, there are some perfectly placed Nazi swastikas uh, at several moments. And we have the moments where uh, the Nazis storm in and interrupt things, and, uh, or the police take her father away, things like that, and then they come for her and for Alexander. But you never go dark in visual tone. You keep that visual tonal band with light, so darkness, it comes, the darkness I detected was within her paintings themselves that you showcase. <clears throat> Such as when we see the images of, of Alfred, the shyster that he was, <laughs> uh, as my grandmother would say, or, uh, you know, or her grandfather, her great-grandfather. So I'm curious about that perspective to not go into darker animated tones 
Yeah, uh, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, I think primarily with Charlotte Sullivan um, and her story, what we really wanted to do was figure out a way to um, feature her as the, the, the main driver in her own story mm -hmm. and not allow, um, not really get, have the art direction get in the way of uh, her performance. Um, for example, mm -hmm. we spent a lot of time um, making conscious decisions to frame the camera close to her so that um, if we went sort of over the top in terms of flashy sequences and art direction, you would lose those those subtle nuanced things that, that mm -hmm. make a character really be alive um, and represent her her reality, the world that she lived in, um, in a way that, that she would be front and center. So we didn't really spend a lot of time showcasing the brown shirts or the Nazis because they weren't really what the story was about. Right. It, it's, it's about Charlotte, it's, it's her perspective, it's her point of view. Um, and I think there aren't really many scenes that don't feature her um, because this is really what our objective was as, as, as filmmakers is, is to put Charlotte front and center so audiences could connect with her. Um, so we, we made a conscious choice to design um, the style of the film and the colors uh, to feature her when she was on screen so that when we did those transitions and we do go to her paintings, like you said, they, they, they really come alive and stand out. So yeah. those, those two things don't fight with each other. Mm -hmm. um, so it's an intentional juxtaposition um, and I'm, I'm really grateful that you picked up on that um, because that was, yeah, that was the choice that we made. Now, is it my imagination or when you look at Charlotte's paintings and you have oranges and yellows in some of them and then puncture with, with the blue, the indigos, uh, and edged in that, the expressionist take on it. But then we have yellow when she's in, at O'Teal's. You're using two different shades. You're using different shades so that the real world is not encroaching on these paintings. Okay, I did not yeah. imagine it. Okay. No, that's exactly right. That's a very okay. observant view. Because I'm, I'm looking at the colors, uh, even in the greens, you know, she has some darker tones in the paintings. And you can really tell where her mindset was, what, what she was recalling when she was painting those. It's remarkable. Her, her paintings um, that she she executed in, in such a short amount of time there were s several hundreds and um, and what I really connect to is there's a, a certain amount of um, it, it, it it felt rushed and it felt hurried um, and I think in that sort of frenetic style she communicated to me at least what her mindset was and I think what she was really trying to do was I, I think she had a, a premonition that she wasn't long for this yeah. earth um, and and the way it comes across you can you can really see it um, and uh, it, I'm, I'm just so grateful to be able to showcase it as front and center as it, as it deserves to be mm -hmm. how did you select because I know, Julia, you've been, you have, this has been a passion of yours. You know, how did you select the paintings that would be showcased? But more importantly, which of those years in her life? Because you're, I, and I love the fact that for people that don't know their history, you do have the Chiron on there so we can see what year it is. So people can go Google it if they need to. Um, but these are very specific pinpoints. So I'm curious about the thought that went into the painting selected and these specific points of time. Um, I'll speak to the, the story selection because I developed this as I do um, live action films. So mm -hmm. I spent a long time with screenwriters and we locked the script and then we voided the script and there were some changes, but it was, um, it was amazing how close the final film was to the scripted version of it. So uh, we organized this as a biopic mm -hmm. and we looked at Charlotte's um, whole life and made choices not to show her as a child. You know, the regular choices one makes yeah. when one does an adaptation. 
In Life for Theater, Charlotte doesn't spend a lot of time depicting her time in France. I think it was principally an act of memory. She's a refugee. Right. She doesn't know when she's going to go back to Berlin, and so she paints and paints and paints about Berlin. She falls in love with another man, but she paints and paints about her love affair back in Berlin. So I think she felt compelled to also witness and record mm -hmm. what she saw. So we, we went from, uh, we had an earlier scene when she, was a, a, when she left high school that we ended up taking out. So we made, most of our decisions were dramaturgical rather than mm -hmm. historical. Uh, and uh, we went beyond the scope of her life story that she depicted herself. Because mm -hmm. I found that very interesting with the points that you picked. And I also think she kept painting Alfred because it has also to be cathartic. She had to get that out of her system. She got cheated on. Yeah. And lied to. And yet he was the one who, and this made sense to me and to a bunch of other uh, women, and I don't know if it makes sense to you, but when you're a young woman, you meet that man who sort of sees you for the woman you want to be. Yes, and, and he's the one that put her on this path. And, and encouraged her to yeah. be an artist and connected with her as an artist. So whereas her stepmother thought it was a hobby, uh, he was like, oh, you're an artist, I'm a writer, we're of this same group together. Mm -hmm. So I think that's also why she kept painting him over and over again. Yeah. After the war, he survived and went to London and denied that they ever had a sexual relationship. See, he's a shyster. <laughs> that's a good word. Yeah. <laughs> he is. And the selection of paintings that, that you chose to focus on I, I that had to be you, difficult. Sir. Yeah, there was a lot of back and forth. Uh, there was some shouting message. Um, yeah, it was a it was a great collaboration. Myself, my co director Eric, and and Julie was obviously very involved. Um, I think each of us had different favorite paintings, um, and some didn't really fit in in terms of the narrative point that we were at in the film. So, so some we can feature, um, but I think I think we made right correct choices and your favorite made it in it did yeah okay what's the favorite <laughs> what's oh, the I, I, I don't know the name of it but it's 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 got the those flowers come to life with, um, and just a different moments of, of her life it's it's a really big collage um, I was really happy to be um, very intimately involved with the um, figuring out with um, our compositing studio just the order of which the parts of her painting would bloom to life. Mm -hmm. um, so I got to essentially storyboard, you know, almost paint backwards, like, okay, oh, how wow. would Charlotte approach this? And let's start here, and then let's have this window open. And um, God, it was so gratifying to be able to do that. And uh, such a unique experience, almost to step in front of the canvas the way she would. and. Um, compose uh, uh, a work of art so um, I, uh, I really relished those uh, those opportunities it was an amazing moment because it came quite late in the process and we always had these slugs in there saying our transitions our transitions <laughs> our transitions but we didn't know what they would be and um, as can happen in a production we were quite busy all the time and so it kept being punted and punted and then finally to hear uh, worked with um, some artists in Belgium on it and when they came in we were all Overwhelmed with how incredible they were. So thanks, T. You did a great it job. It could have gone. Could have gone either way. I'm <laughs> glad. Uh, I'm glad that they turned out. Yeah. Better. How integral um, was the Charlotte Salomon Foundation, or the museum, the Holocaust Museum, where this exhibit hangs? Was there any kind of light issues with licensing and? wanting to tell this story. I'm curious about that aspect. I met with them, um, so when the idea came into my head on a run one morning, a long, you know, 12 years ago now, I, I got into my house and I was still covered in sweat and sat down at the laptop and Googled Charlotte Salomon Foundation and sent off an email, are the rights available? And then got into the shower and was like, what have I done? <laughs> and 12 years later, and then I went to see them a few months later. And no, the option was fine. I think that, um, they were really helpful to us because over those years, information about Charlotte surfaced. Mm -hmm. And I needed their guidance as to whether or not they thought this was biographically accurate. So let's remember that Charlotte called her work life, question mark, or theater, question mark. So she invites us to question the mm -hmm. role of truth in representation and veracity. And at the same time, decades later, 
we're making a film about a woman who dies in Auschwitz. And so there are facts and things are true, which is another reason, as Tahir said, we chose an art direction that was quite realistic. You know, everyone has five fingers, it's anatomically correct. Uh, so, yeah, it was an interesting combination. But the Charlotte Salomon, Salomon Foundation has been wonderful. They had approval over the screenplay, which I was happy to provide to them. Mm -hmm. And they wanted also to see the visual look. So mm -hmm. they, uh, they got to sign off on both. Now, did they have, because when we get to the credits at the end, and you give us incredible, you know, archival footage, interviews with her parents. Um, did they provide that? Did you have to hunt that down? It's, um, I, so there's some, most of, all of Life for Theater is at the Jewish Museum in Amsterdam. Right. But there are some works in Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. And there are representations of Charlotte's uh, representation of the rise of Nazism in the main section of Yad Vashem mm -hmm. and also in the art museum of Yad Vashem. And in the art museum in Yad Vashem, they had that video. And like with the art transitions, it came to the process quite late. We, we had locked picture. We were just uh, final, we were about to go into the sound mix, the final sound mix. And the idea came to us and we put it in there, and it, 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 it was an overwhelming moment for all of us. Yeah, I mean, after you watch this beautiful film, and you really understand a big part of who Charlotte was, and what she was feeling, and facing in life, um, as a very young woman, I mean, to die at 26 is just... And to have made so much work. Yeah, that just we should be so lucky to even do half that much in our lifetime um, but then to see the epilogue with what happened with everybody but those the interviews were just mind-blowing and the footage that you start with of the crates of works being taken out of a building just it just makes your heart stop for me it's when we see the CS we yes. see her initials in the archival footage after we've seen it throughout the film at, at important moments. Yeah, it really, I mean, obviously it, it grounds the film in a way that is unexpected. You know, one last, because I know she wants to haul me away, but I've got to <laughs> ask, <laughs> Lurky Lou, um, <laughs> I've got to ask each of you, you know, what did you each take away from the making of Charlotte? as filmmakers that you can take forward into future works now because this is not a traditional biopic um, and this has so much more gravitas to it than I'd say 90% of the biopics live action or otherwise that are ever made. Wow. So I'm curious what each of you as filmmakers took away from the making of Charlotte bringing it to life that you can employ in your future works. I think what's what's really interesting about about this is is just the meeting of two worlds in that Julie comes from a, a live action background and, and, and that's where she spent her, her career and I come from an animation background so I've only worked on um, animated films and, and television um, so I, I think there's a there's a profound respect for, for sort of both ways to approach filmmaking that that's kind of came together in this hybrid way. Um, for me, uh, I, I really hope I get the chance to, to work on something like this again because it, it is so unique and it is so rare yeah. as an animator um, to work on mature cinema and um, understand the, the differences between you know, something for, for children, um, which I've spent my entire career. So um, I, I take away a, a real profound respect for... Um, the craft of filmmaking and um, gosh I learned so much um, and uh, I, I really yeah I really appreciate the opportunity and, and I hope I hope it happens again and what about for you Julia that's a great answer to hear uh, you can't copy it <laughs> I won't copy it I, I think <clears throat> what came to mind when you asked the question is that what I learned from making this film I learned from spending so much time thinking about Charlotte Salomon and her life. And one of the takeaways is that 
meaningful work requires intense commitment and it pays off with a, a meaningful experience so that's what I take and so what I hope to bring to everything else that I do and whether it's a comedy or uh, another drama or animation or television is that is that deep deep commitment to help people tell stories that uh, hopefully move in and entertain a public. Well, I'm so glad you both told this story because I knew about her work going into this, but I didn't know the depth of what surrounded it and her life. So we also get an education with this film. It's a win-win. <laughs> well, as long as it's not medicine, as long as it's also a ride. But thank as you long so as much. As long as it's not somebody putting poison in my omelet, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Oh, thank you so much for your really, thank really you uh, attentive viewing of the film. Your questions were really oh, on you. point and specific, and we're grateful for uh, your level of attention on our work. I'm going to watch it again because there's so much I know. Because I'm, I, the color was capturing my eyes as the you know during those montage transitions and the color was happening and it was detracting me almost because I was so spellbound by it. So when we slide into the next moment, you know I'm still thinking about the beauty, you know of those sunflowers that are being painted and bursting open. Um, so I'm definitely watching it again. That's awesome. <laughs> someone, someone said to me once after watching it that despite the darkness, all of the transitions that to hear designed and directed, leave the viewer with a feeling of hope. Oh, th this film. Which is incredible given yeah. how dark the story is. Yeah. You walk out being feeling, oh, doing something creative, creativity has the power to get us out of despair and yeah. feel hope. And Charlotte's work. This particular work, life or theater, I mean, just all you have to do is look at it and it inspires you. So, thank you so much. And now you've opened it up to so many people. Let's hope. <laughs> oh, guys, thank you. Thank you. It was a real, real pleasure. I you. hope we get to do this again in the future. Yeah, it'd be great. Mm -hmm.